today, I would like to welcome to the podcast, Jason Troy. He is an executive coach who helps executives, managers, and employees to maximize their leadership and management potential. He provides coaching workshops and speaking services. He is the best-selling author of Social Wealth, the how-to guide on building extraordinary business relationships. I've started this book and it's really good and I'm really enjoying it so far. He was a featured speaker uh, at the 2017 TED X Wilmington for his talk on how to get coworkers to like each other. That's on the internet, guys. You can just go get that on YouTube. I did that a couple days ago. His employee engagement and team building game, Cards Against Mundanity. I cannot say that word. I know it's a tough word to say. So. Mund- mundanity. Mundan- mundanity. Yeah. Mundanity. Mundanity. Has- has been played more than 12,000 plus by more than 12,000 plus employees and to increase performance and teamwork. Jason has his law degree and master's in communications from Syracuse University. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks. And I actually updated the downloads to 20,000 actually because I got a lot more evidence. Yeah, I've got a lot more people coming telling me stuff. So it's really interesting how many more people are playing it. And, And like we talked about before, the lagging indicators of like how many or what, and I'm pretty conservative in the numbers I give out. So yeah. I try to get enough of them back or, or when I'm speaking and compile right. the list. So I get closer enough to do the back of the envelope calculations when I have people telling me things. So that's awesome. And so guys, those are free. Um, and we'll put okay. those in the description box, um, put the link in there so you can download them. I downloaded them myself cause I want to do this with my team. Um, so my first question is always the same. What was your first job? Uh, it was being a caddy and I worked at a movie theater at night because I could make money, uh, all the time. And the caddy, one of the things about doing it was at the golf course that I could do it at, I found that people could do carry two people's bags at once. Once you got a little bit farther along, right? And those people were making more money double bagging for people because you couldn't take carts um, out in the course. You had to have some special deal to do that. So essentially people, members had to carry their own bags. Oh, that's awesome. Of course. So yeah, so it was away. And it was tip based, right? So just like a restaurant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you could do it during the day. And then at night, and this is when I was 15. So I could work. Mm-hmm. And then at in the movie theater, I found that I could work when I was only 15 for whatever reason. And so I didn't get paid that much, but I got to watch movies and it was something I could do. Right. <laughs> so did you get free golf too? Uh, no, but it was, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty fun. I mean, mm-hmm. I did it for a couple of summers and then it was, that's, it was a lot of work too. Cause you had to physically carry 18 holes. That is a lot of work. Chicago. <laughs> and I mean, that was, it was not a, it was not an easy job to say the least. One of my cousins, um, is a valet. Um, and he, he's been doing it for years and years and years. And I keep telling him I need to come do it one day a week so I can get my cardio in. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's serious running. <laughs> yeah, I used to bar cart. Um, oh, okay. In college, um, I worked at a country club, and I literally did everything. But one of the things I did in the summer was bar cart. Um, yeah. And that was always fun because the guys were like, "Here, put your own shot for you too." And I'm just like, "Guys, I got to drive this thing around the course the five thousand more times today." <laughs> okay, so let's get in some nitty gritty here because you've got lots of content that I want to talk about. Um, so anyone who is paying attention to company culture discussions know that employees are disengaged um, and most companies are having a horrible time shifting cultures to one of collaboration. So we talk about participation age companies all the time, but what does that really look like and how are companies getting there? So what is your take on why the shift to participation age uh, work styles is so difficult? Well, the problem is being is we throw all these people together in a complex organism and just expect it to work, right? And it never does, because it assumes we just can figure things out together and that doesn't work really well. In fact, I've been doing a bunch of conflict resolution work over the last couple of years and people have been coming to me and it's not something I advertise that I do, but people have. And I've sort of done back of the envelope calculations asking people and I'm like an average team of five of high performing people because someone won't come to me unless a team is worth keeping together, right? So high performing team of like five people, on average, I found waste somewhere between 200 and 275 hours a month 
on misunderstandings, miscommunications, conflicts, you know, all the rest of these things that are hurting their performance and productivity overall and, and emotional turmoil. And it just keeps going on because no one knows what to do and how to step in. And the problem is, is that mediation fails because a lot of the times I'm not the first person brought in. In fact, I'm usually not. And they have gone other places because the key is how do I build trust, rebuild trust? And how do I get people to be much more self-aware, right, in a situation like that? And the trust is the first issue that needs to be built on step one. And people conveniently miss over that, right? But like, well, because I'll listen to, I heard some high-level person at Facebook talk about, um, she's some, a book coming out about building trust. And I've listened to some podcasts and there's really... Like it doesn't say specifically how do you build trust and how do you go about doing this and breaking it down. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and, and it seems like some amorphous thing that you either have it or you're not, or you have to do all these complex web of things. And I think it's much more simple than that when you break it down and look into it and you have to make it a priority and make it really intentional because otherwise everything else just breaks down. I was reading another stat, 66% of startup businesses fail, like successful startups, um, because of not only co-founder issues, but management team issues that are all related to interpersonal conflicts and miscommunication. Those two things alone. No, no other reason, not the, not the product, not the service, not the solution. The, the people. people can't get along, and so it falls apart, right? And that's pretty common, right? I mean, yeah. it's, 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 again, if we gave people a roadmap, and show people what to do in it, explicit conversations, right? Like a box of instructions. And we opened up in the beginning and shared really and, and stripped down and shared who we are, our experiences, our values and everything else. People would have a much better feeling of the other people. They'd feel safer having interactions, creating like psychological safety and all these other things that are requirement to do great work in teams with other people. But instead, mm -hmm. we just throw them together and it comes down to guesswork, mind reading, trial by many errors, mm -hmm. and then we just expect it all to happen and it becomes a random mess of biology, neurology, psychology of why we pick what we do and all these things around diversity and diverse opinions and mm -hmm. it's and, and then it becomes a sea of craziness, right? Instead of having it be operationalized and engineered where you get consistently the same results. And I believe, and I've seen it, there's no reason why it can't be that way everywhere if people actually had a system to do it significantly faster from the day an employee walked in the door and made it a priority rather than an afterthought. Yeah, we hear people talk about, you know, leader-leader structures instead of, like, manager-employee structures. Um, and this conversation around trust really helps solidify this, in my mind, about how this leader-leader stuff works. Because we've had, I've watched many businesses or I've talked to, you know, employees and businesses that are trying to break down that manager-employee structure. And then it just fails. And, you know, always my question is why? Why did it fail? What did they screw up? Like what happened within the, the culture? Yeah. And that's, you can't lead people or be led if you don't trust the people around you. And, and so, extreme trust. Yeah, the thing extreme. about it is, yeah, it's not. So here's where it's really interesting when you think about trust. So the first, the pro, all problems come down, almost every organizational problem comes down to two things, what happens that goes through the human brain unconsciously. One, do I trust you or do I not, right? And, we, and if, we, if I don't, we don't even get to question two. Mm -hmm. But if we do, then the next question is, is what level of trust do I have with you? Mm -hmm. And if I don't have extreme trust with you, then it's almost like I actively distrust you. And what I mean by that is if you had a rate on a scale of one to five, right? One from, you know, extreme distrust to five extreme trust, what the data has shown, Harvard Business Review had a whole thing on this last month in May that if you don't rate your manager a five, in terms of engagement, it's the same thing as having a one. So if you say you just trust them, a four out of five, right? 
and they're rated by the team, it's the same thing as having it, I actively distrust you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. And, and, and the reason is, is that if I don't put you in my inner circle psychologically, right? So think about it. Everyone think about the best, your best friend, your partner, some people that you love, mm -hmm. right? That is your inner circle. The reason is, is because everything you value that relationship over the argument or the situation. Mm. So you'll find a workaround, like human nature wise, right? Or you'll let it go or something will happen in order for you to move forward, right? In general. But everyone else, you won't. Because that's not, there's no value there for you because you don't feel any loss. There's no great loss in your life if that goes away, right? Yes. Right? Really. And the other problem starts to be is that, so when I walk in the door on day one, you now have a paradigm. There is either trust or distrust. There's really no gray in the middle, right? I guess you could say there's no trust if I don't know you at all, but we make such quick judgments that all the other things start the arrows moving on either side for trust or distrust. Mm -hmm. And the problem tends to be is more trust begets more trust and distrust begets more distrust. So it's very hard to turn them around. And what starts to happen in people's mind is, let's take two situations. Like, let's say that you uh, are meeting a friend out for dinner and that friend is late. If you have a high level of trust for that person, your first thing is positive intent. Oh, they probably got stuck in traffic. Oh, it's not that big a deal. You know, life gets in the way, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're in a shaky relationship with them or in some level of distrust or maybe not as close with them, you're probably thinking, you know, they probably don't care about my time. Like, why are they late? Like, I showed up on time. Why am I waiting for them? Blah, 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 right? Well, that creates more distrust. And mm -hmm. it's really hard to break those cycles. And at least in that friendship, you have some other background, but at work, like we don't think like that. It's very business oriented. So it's even harder in an environment like that. Well, then everything falls apart, right? Mm -hmm. Because if I just trust you, there's no psychological safety I can create. There's no close working relationship. There's no really good teamwork. I'm not going to share things with you just openly. I'm going to try to be perfect with you. I mean, all these mm -hmm. things start coming up. If I'm in conflict with you, I won't give you the benefit of the doubt. I won't confront you early on with issues. I'll let them fester, right? And then I'll talk behind your back and create all this other atmosphere, right? So these things all occur, right? And the problem is, is that organizations don't attack the trust problem from the first, from the get-go. They try to say, oh, there's a conflict. Oh, there's a problem in our business. Let's have to fix it. Well, it's a trust problem before it's another problem. Mm -hmm. So if you don't fix the trust, it's not going to work, right? People say, well, our employee engagement is low. And I'm like, well, yeah, but they don't trust you to begin with. So right. you, you could fix the survey, but you're not going to fix the people unless you do something to create a close sense of closeness across the board, because that's not the real core issue in the bottom foundational level. You're missing it and you're just dressing it up. And you won't really get to that place. So we have to go back to the beginning and saying, okay, well, what can we do mm -hmm. to bring people closer together so they fundamentally understand each other and can work better together and cause less misunderstandings, less conflict, all the rest of these things, right? It's so, the same with diversity, right? The other thing I, people talk about all the right. time is today is a hot topic is, oh, diversity and not even diversity of thinking, but people. And I'm like, well, the issue is that we go back when we're a baby. Mm -hmm. No baby I've ever seen in my entire life was racist, sexist, homophobic, or whatever, mm -hmm. right? We learn these things. Mm -hmm. Well, if we learn them, it, it then becomes a lot of these things are fears or we don't run across other people in those situations that we can see ourselves inside of. But mm -hmm. if you start to share common experiences, because I've seen this through groups and doing it, mm -hmm. no one cares. If you have lost and you realize someone else is at the same level of loss, Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about, oh, that they're a woman or they're a man or they're this mm -hmm. or they're that. You just relate to them on a human level. So mm -hmm. some of this stuff just goes back to some core basic things that we're just forgetting and not investing in. And then it hurts the organization, the bottom line. So I really think about when you talk about um, the erosion of trust um, in organizations, um, it really solidifies for me you know, what has happened in some of my relationships? Like what, what was the breakdown? Um, and it was trust. Like it was trust for that person. It was trust for that, that person had the best 
um, um, the best, you know, for me in mind, um, or, you know, was paying attention to me or what, you know, what needed to happen in my life or what was going on and things like that. So it's very interesting that you, that, you know, when we do think about it, it is core in trust and it really does solidify for me why I leave situations. It's because of an erosion of trust or an erosion of just like not really, you know, feeling like I'm part of the team or there is a team or things like that. Yeah, it makes it, 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 and it's true because then we start to feel an erosion of trust towards individuals, right? What happens right. is then we're on this team and we don't feel safe being ourselves, right? So then it's impossible to create psychological safety, mm -hmm. which is a precursor they found out is the number one reason for high performing teams is you can show up as yourself. You can dissent, you can argue, you can tell people things, you can share your emotions. I mean, all of these things are requirement because otherwise we're hiding. Yes. Right. And, no. and, and, and here's the problem. If we hide in the business world, we have learned in our personal life that we hide on Facebook, we hide everywhere, but the only time we can ever be ourselves with people that we're super close with, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the business world's the same way. Mm -hmm. And so you're not, if you're not yourself, we're not operating under core strengths and we're not as motivated, we're not determined, we're not gonna work as hard, right? I mean, right. all this stuff I saw stat by Gartner research that showed that, you know, and this is self-reporting even, six, only 16% of employees said they are coming to work every day giving their maximum effort. Right. I mean, yeah. and there's all this data out there that's, you know, what is it? 86% of executives cite communication and collaboration as reason that projects and other things fail. Right. I mean, the problem is, is no one's asking, well, how do we fix these things? Right. They right. just, they just assume that it's the team and it's the people and the rest of it. Or it's, it's the culture. It's the culture. Right. And I hate that word in some regards because I do too. <laughs> it's easy, it's easy to blame something that's amorphous. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and then to not understand it. And in, that's the reason why, because people don't want to deal with it. So then they just call it that mm -hmm. without breaking it down and really saying, okay, well, culture just is made up of trust. It's made up of different elements. And if you don't have all of those, then you don't have a culture. Right. right. You don't, you don't have, you don't have solidified values. In a, in a company, no. if you don't trust the company, like you, you don't buy into the values. Right? No, right? And, and, and you have to have values that are operationalized, meaning that people are actually looking at performance reviews and giving money for them and mm -hmm. promoted on whatever it is. And you can only have so many values in order to go through that because it's impossible for you to take a look at those things. So you have to pick and choose where or what's at the top of your list, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and that's life, but you, 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 if you don't make a choice, then you have not, nothing, right? <laughs> Right. Exactly. And, and that, and that becomes, you have no culture, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, all these things have to be decisions and prioritize and time spent. And what people think is, I don't have any time for this. Right. That's what I hear all the time. And I'm like, Oh, but you do have time to lose 275 hours a month arguing with your coworkers and not talking to them. I did, I forgot that you have that many hours, but you don't have an hour a week to do some of this work or in the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can lose all that money and that's okay. <laughs> Right. Like, and that's what happens in large organizations. I mean, it's, this is not like something I saw another stat for every a hundred thousand employees or a hundred employees, the average company wastes $420,000 as a floor in miscommunication a year. That's right. My brain. I know. Now, at some level, we're not going to be able to get rid of all of that. Right. We could argue, but I, I bet that number is still be people. In half, right. Right. So, you could hire anyone and people to come in every year and work at that problem and you'd be making a six to seven X return on your money. So crazy. Right. And, and, and you could hire really good people and spend a lot of time and money on it to do that as well mm -hmm. because you, you'd be making a significant portion R of what's going on. Oh, right? it's a huge ROI, right? Huge ROI every year, right? To make sure that you are having that number and getting it down to 200,000 or 150 rather than 420. And that's a floor. It's a lot higher in a lot of organizations than that. I've seen mm -hmm. data way higher than that. So it's, just, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a problem we don't want to talk about because 
it requires other people to take massive action and prioritize it. Mm -hmm. And they can just delay it by looking at balance sheet things and saying, well, there's no time for this because we are doing something else, right? And then it requires you to argue with the CEO who then can fire you, right? Right. Um, or hurt your career advancement. And so then you're like, well, I don't want to do this, so I won't say anything, right? And this, this goes on and back and forth from people. And you will see some progressive organizations, but they are a very, very, very few, right? right? Very small in total. Right. So we have our Zappos, we have our WD-40. There, I mean, there's a few out there that, are, that have got this right. Yeah, there are, and there's people, companies like Stripe I've been reading about, and there's some, and there's pockets and organizations that are doing this, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just in a whole, you're not seeing that many companies do this and lead this forward, like Warby Parker's another one. I mean, there are ones that you can seek out and find, but it's full of very progressive people that are making it a company priority. That care about and, people that care about people and it's a top-down thing mm -hmm. and they're implementing real processes and they're on the cutting edge of what's going on and they understand these things. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is that very, very, very few people did because four years ago when I started this out, I didn't understand all these things. I mean, it took me a lot of work to stitch all this together. It's like, there's no book I read on this. I had mm -hmm. to read books and I'm still reading it and looking at research to stitch this together because there's just, it's hard to piece it all together to make some sort of cogent argument talking about strategy just because no one's really done it before. Yeah, They're no. not really talking about it in terms of this. And so we're really on the, er, I'd say on the super early side of adopters on this thing. Right? I think that's totally true. It's I think, true. and like I said, you know, there's all these things we talk about um, with, um, participation age and leader leader and you know having engaged teams and all of this but it's all very nebulous like how do we do that thing um and, and the that, that's the problem right because right. i go into places and i've had a recon deconstruct in my head overlooking and talking to people and starting to think about how do you start doing these things mm -hmm. and getting people together it's the same thing i'm doing even things like mediation or reconciliation. Like I had a couple of clients come to me two years ago and I didn't really know what to do. Like, I mean, I sort of did, mm -hmm. but then I had to look at all the research and none of this stuff made any sense to me, right? And it's the same problem like in marriage counseling. If we get two people together who can't see each other's opinion and shove them in a room, how do we expect them going to work itself out? Well, that's why it rarely does. And most people go to it, I talk to, it fails. Mm -hmm. Or they'll go, to, or they'll go to multiple and maybe one will work in some degree, but not over the long term, because we've got to go and trust each other. We've got to look at our own blind spots and mm -hmm. understand those. We have to do our separate work, not a part of that part group, and then come back together, fall on our sword and figure out a better path forward. Well, and that's so hard for people to do. Right. But that's not a, that's, I mean, I, I've yet to see some therapist who's recommending you go to other therapists outside of me and work on it or work with me separately and then bring you in a room because there's liability, there's other issues, right? Mm -hmm. There's all these things going on. So therefore then you, we just try to work it out together. And I mean, people are not going to be able to do that and they don't, right? Because mm -hmm. so, you, you have to know who you are and what you want. Exactly. And that's the problem. It's not, it's not the problem you argue. It's the problem that you don't see who you are and where your blind spots are and haven't done the work before. So you mm -hmm. can't go in and do the look in the accountability mirror. I mean, if you, the first time is the hardest. After that, you can do soul searching and find someone and figure the answers out a lot faster. But it's the same thing in organizations today too, right? I mean, they're not, no one's really looked and understanding what does really employee engagement mean? Like, mm -hmm. why does it really matter? How do we really onboard an employee? Like, I've rarely, I mean, I don't think there's an or, or CEO I've ever seen that have walked to HR and said, walk me through every step of the way when that employee comes in the room. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. Yet, now we've got all these problems and people wonder why that they're there. And I'm like, well, yeah, because you don't even know what's going on, right? I mean, I looked at like LinkedIn. Someone sent me a couple years ago, LinkedIn onboarding process, and it's a huge step-by-step -step process. Mm -hmm. Like one of the side notes is employee getting to know other employees through like an icebreaker. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, it's like 0.2 of 0.70 or something like this. And I'm like, no, that's steps of one through 60, right? Like the only thing Emma cares about in the onboarding process is like no one ever remembers it, but they do remember building great relationships with people and when it started.
Mm-hmm. Day and if one. it can start with day one. Yeah. Who cares about the rest? I mean, like end of the day, if you don't go and explain the benefits from people will go figure that on their own. I mean, they'll, you, and they'll you figure out what they're supposed to be doing and they'll yeah, figure I mean, out how to handle that software and they'll figure out what they're drawing. Yeah. And they'll figure or they'll just out. ask questions or you put an FAQ up and you videos and people watch it and figure it out or they ask you some questions, but those are easy question and answers that you can do, right? But you, but you can't do the meaning of other people because there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety. People don't know what to do and how to go about doing it. And they're not well, going to sit there and ask someone questions like, so right. tell me about the biggest setback you've had in the last five years mm -hmm. and how that affected you, right? Tell me, you know, your biggest pet peeve, right? And what not to do with you. No one asks those questions, but those are the questions that make the biggest difference in working with people and getting to know them. Mm -hmm. You just... They just figure, well, at some point we'll figure this out in the learning curve. And maybe they do. And a lot of times they never do. Right. And, and what happens there? Then the relationship is either hurt, distrust, and then that affects every person that you're working with. So now you are a victim in, an, in a team. You're a victim of where the worst relationship lies. The, the weakest link will break you, it, right? And mm -hmm. that's the problem. And you're a victim of that. And a lot of people, I don't think, really realize that that they're living in this randomness that how great of their work effort employee is going to be dictated by the people on their team and the people who don't have good relationships. That's so true. I mean, every team I've been on, you know, like if we didn't all get along or we didn't all like know each other intimately, it just doesn't work. It never does. That's the, every high performing team I've watched when I started to do look at the top 1% teams and watch them, it's, they all do, right? They, they all appreciate each other for who they are and they want to be around them and value their opinion or at mm -hmm. least enough their opinion to listen to it because it'll make them stop and think at the very least, mm -hmm. which is a whole different process than the rest of the teams go on, right? And that is the difference. It's, I, you know, it, and I think because of that, you'll like a person. Maybe you won't be friends with them. And I don't think that's a requirement is to be friends with someone or social friends for things to be successful. No. I think that's commonly a byproduct, but it doesn't have to be one. But you won't value someone or like them unless you really get to know them because then you'll truly respect their opinion and actually listen to it to begin with. Otherwise, you'll... When they're talking to you, what most people do is they're formulating their counter argument or argument, right? right. And they're not even hearing what the other person is really saying. Mm -hmm. They have to be on the defensive. If you understand people's stories and you understand where they've come from and you have that like level of knowledge, then you can filter what they're saying through their experience. Definitely. And it makes a huge difference because... And I was in a group and someone mentioned that, the, you know, and I thought this is always a brilliant, uh, like fi when someone figures this out, mm -hmm. that understanding someone's experiences helped me connect the dots with their behavior mm -hmm. and, and where their hot buttons are and why they might get defensive. Right. And I think that's just, it's so true. Once you understand all this stuff, you can piece together because at the end of the day, we're all patterns. Mm -hmm. And we're ones and zeros. And it all stems from growing up, our relationship with our parents, how they form our blueprint and our identity with the world. And all that stuff you heard about psychologists saying most of the things, problems we have come from under the age of 10 is all true. Mm -hmm. When I do blind spots and self-awareness, but it also, you can figure that out through other people sharing where mm -hmm. their trials and tribulations and challenges are you can connect the dots to where they're currently having problems with, and that will help you significantly understanding or ask the next question, tell me more. Yeah. It seems like that's a hot button when I bring that up with you, mm -hmm. what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then you can get a lot more information rather than doing it, ignoring it, or what 99% of the people do is just never have a conversation about it and then have it fester until the point is where it explodes, right? And then you have to do massive work to rebuild the trust but not only the trust there it fractures the entire team right because now now everybody's got conflict or like feels the conflict they do. or or people are caught in between and mm -hmm. trying to play like switzerland right <laughs> and they don't have a choice because they know it'll all implode and mm -hmm. that will cause them 
issues like getting fired or just having massive amount of liability. So you get put in situations where this is what occurs with individuals and teams. And it's a, and it's extremely common. I mean, it's it very uncommon not to find this, right? And most right. of the time, people just let the stuff go. They never really, you know, it gets bad enough, yeah, they'll bring in people. But in a lot of the times, they'll just let it go, right? Because it's mm -hmm. bad enough, but not bad enough to have someone come in. Mm -hmm. um, but those people are suffering. And then what happens is people just quit. Yeah, people just leave. And then you and have And they to... make other excuses why they quit and left. But the reality is because of this. So, yeah, you're talking about, like, who we are is like solidified before 10 and I've got little kids and you're scaring the crap out of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Maybe I yeah. can figure out their blind spots before they get, you know. Uh, no, no, but that's okay. You okay. just can help them actually later on and okay. that'll be okay. So how do organizations create trust? Like what is the, what is the biggest keys to making that happen? Well, I think there's a couple of them that I've found that I've starting to do with people. Um, one is I, I, I it's pretty basic, right? This first step is a simple one is just to help people create a user manual of each other, mm -hmm. right? Oh, because if, if the, the key thing is we do guesswork, mind reading, and hope as a strategy in terms of when we throw diverse people together. But if we at each person fill out stuff like, you know, what's your pet peeve? How do you like to communicate best with people? Um, if you're having a bad day, how can I help you or how can I approach you, mm -hmm. right? All these other things. So people explicitly know how to interact with you and you give them a roadmap and you give them specific instructions and then you can write and then you have one-on-one -on -one conversations or a group about it as well. And then you can understand each person, right? And go through it. And then, you know, it's not perfect, but what it is is that you'll get way closer. And here's the other thing will happen is that then if you have a conflict, Mm -hmm. You can pull this out and saying, hey, I tried to do this. And the other person will say, well, yeah, but you didn't do this. Mm -hmm. We could just add to it. Yeah. And usually that's probably just a small little thing that they didn't do or something mm -hmm. that they can easily do. So it starts the conversation. And it gives someone permission to go and do that where you wouldn't do it any other way, right? You right. just continue on with the conflict and the stories and false narratives that start to occur in teams, right? So that's a, that's a huge piece of it. The second one is where I originally, uh, I, that's why I created my game Cards Against Mundanity was just that what I found was that in today's agile world of throwing people together, we have to build really close working relationships because end of the day, we have to have our work be more important in our relationships over the argument, conflict, or whatever's going on. And in order, an only way to do that is to put someone in your inner circle. Well, that requires you to know them intimately really fast and know information that only people who really knew, know them would know, right? And when you look at the data, also the other part of it is, is that think to yourself, everyone here has met someone in five or 10 minutes where they felt like they've known them their entire life or knew them really well, right? You had mm -hmm. some crazy incident where you met someone like, oh my gosh, like you can read my mind or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened there is someone was vulnerable by sharing something pretty small, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be in where you live, why'd you go to this event, I don't, whatever it might be. And then you stair-stepped it up and then something, someone said something and it skyrocketed up and then you skyrocketed up. And end of the day, what happened is you did in that one conversation what a normal person would do in 20 or 30. And it's the vulnerable sharing with the words, not with the actions. And it's funny because everywhere you'll hear action, actions mean more than words. And actually the reality is, I think that's actually really false now that I've looked at it because when's the last person that's ever gotten married without saying I do? Right. Never. Making a contract, a verbal contract. Yeah. Walking down the aisle and doing the wedding doesn't, I do. When's the, who do you know? If you could, if, if everyone here could think to themselves, think about the person that you love and care about the most. What if you could never have said, I love you to that person ever? Mm -hmm. What would that have done to your relationship? Would it be as strong as it is now if you could verbally never tell them I love you? Of course it wouldn't be, right? Mm -hmm. The words are actually more important. Think about crazy experiences that you've had with best friends over the years, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the experience that 
really made it. It's the storytelling about it, the repeat telling about it. It's the laughing about where you had been talking about it, not you imagining it and the other person imagining it, right? <laughs> right? And you know what seems rehashing basic? It. Rehashing it is really what it is that we're about, is our words. Mm -hmm. So they're absolutely critical for you to do that. And it's what it's vulnerability and it's doing that skyrockets trust. And what I found is that it's not between two people can be magical, but between groups is transformative. That's so cool. How do you, um, actually, I want to back up real quick. So your, your blueprint, you were talking about the blueprint of like the people blueprint of what's, you know, what's your pet peeve? How do you prefer to interact? You know, how do I approach you with conflict? That would work with clients too. So for our small business owners, um, you know, it doesn't have to be like your employees, if you're a sole partner, like you could do this with your clients. It and then, yes. And then it would help your team too. So if you're handing your team projects, you, you know, you're handing over the blueprint of how to interact with this client. You could, and you could ask them, you know, how, what's your preferred communication style? Yeah, right? I love that. And, and, love and that. like, and, and ask them. And, and, and then when they're looking at you thinking, that's crazy saying, well, you could say, look, like some people love to be called on the phone. Some people rather have a text. Some people have an email. Like mm -hmm. I'd rather, you know, you can fill it out. But I want to understand like in an email, what do you like to read De details or what do you want? Right. Or do mm -hmm. you want to talk more about it on the phone? Because everyone's different. And, and these little details mm -hmm. make, people upset like I'll talk to senior executives that they all they really want is a two sentence email and if you don't figure it out mm -hmm. they won't read the rest of it it's mm -hmm. just a waste of time and they get annoyed with it so but unless you ask them and then they tell you mm -hmm. but they're not proactively asking and telling and informing you and that's the problem there's no explicit conversation about it it's learning by trial and error Mm -hmm. and that becomes the problem that happens. And sometimes you're going to be right, but more times you're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. No matter how good of a mind reader you think you are, or how well you can think you know other people, right. you only know them so well. Yeah. And if you're from the get-go, like if I bring in a team member and I'm like, okay, here's the blueprint for this client. They, pre they prefer to talk on the phone or they prefer an email and then a phone call. Um, or they like bullet points. Don't send yes. them paragraphs. Um, and they're immediately interacting with the client that way. They're immediately creating trust because they're interacting exactly. with the client in a way that is already figured out. And then they can do their best work without worrying about all of these other things getting in the way of it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing, right? I love this. You, you, now you're allowing the people that you have to work at their highest level without getting the little things in the way, mm -hmm. the subtle misunderstandings that handcuff people and crush relationships. And, and the problem is, is that you're hoping that they just figure these things out and I don't. It, it, it rarely works out that way that no. this happens. And these, and you're having bad experiences when you don't need to, and you could do a little bit of front end work mm -hmm. to figure out some of these things that would be really helpful. And the people who you ask the questions with, if you tell them why you're doing it, mm -hmm. they'd rather do it too because there's a benefit for them, right? right. Yeah, I wanted, we want to teach our team how to interact with you best so that there's no communicate miscommunication. There's, you know, there's efficiency in getting your stuff done, you know, and all of these things. Um, you know, if you could answer these questions for us and help us understand how to best interact with you, we can, you know, we can do that and we can provide you with the best service. Yeah, and, and the thing is too, if you fill this out and someone doesn't do something, it's mm -hmm. easy for them to get on the phone and when they give you the feedback, you, you can then look at the information and make the tweak, right? Like right. with the team pretty quickly. Right. right. And the team will understand it because you, at least you're not that far away from where you should be. Right. You're, it's mm -hmm. not like, you know, 180 degree turn or a 90 degree turn that's required. It's a right. very small shift. Right. So, and these are the things that matter. It's service that matters. People will always pay more money in great situations where they like people and they trust them. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the key, but they right. don't want conflict and they don't want all the rest of this stuff getting in the way. Okay. They don't have time. That is so it's, it's just, that's a breakthrough for me in this conversation. Um, one of our values is communication. Um, and it breaks down 
some, in some places, like some clients prefer phone calls, but we're all introverted accountants and we don't want to call people. Yeah. Um, and then here's the problem. It doesn't matter what you want. Right. It doesn't matter what we want. It matters what they want. Yeah. Right? And so if we create a culture of communication, then we're creating a culture of we communicate with a client in the way that they, it's best to communicate with them so that we can all get our stuff done because we care about that. Yeah, and, it, and if you don't, it'll cause you a lot more problems and conflict and issues and take a lot longer. So it's mm-hmm. actually not in your, like, even if you don't want to pick up the phone, you're like, I hate picking up the phone. If you don't, mm-hmm. it's going to cause you hours more of work rather mm-hmm. than spending five minutes on the phone, right? Right, totally. So even if it's nails on the chalkboard for five minutes, it's not another two hours and 55 minutes you've now <laughs> going to waste, right? Of confused emails. Right, of confused of the emails time. and all the drama <laughs> and emotions, right? So you can think about it in terms of that, right? Even if you want to look at his pain threshold and you mm-hmm. can't see the benefit in it, mm-hmm. it's five minutes of pain instead of three hours. <laughs> totally. Right? This is so true. Right. So, so however true. you want to look at it, the carrot and the stick, I always told people, I get it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I may look at it positively, but you look at it however it is that you need to look at it. Right. But that is the realization of what goes on when we don't do these types of things. And you're seeing more and more organizations. Now it's still at a very, very small fraction of leaders doing this thing, but you'll see very true. more and more senior lead. What you'll see, pe- how you'll see people executing this is probably in a couple forms. One, you'll see senior executives doing this where they'll share this with an entire organization so people know how to interact with them, right? Right. And their one, they'll do it differently because they'll do things down to like FYI emails and mm-hmm. open door, right? And they're doing it so you, they can't talk to everyone. That mm-hmm. manual has to be constructed differently than this one. Mm-hmm. This one's more for, I have it, I'm working on a team, or I'm managing a team of people or a couple rungs where I can get to everyone right. and have some conversation with them about it rather than being or I'm the CEO of 10,000 people, right? Then you have to do a much more involved manual in a different one so people know how to interact at a minutia level with you so then they don't miscommunicate stuff and can get to you in a way that is successful for the organization. And you don't have to rely on the rest of your manager, managers and leaders mm-hmm. to provide you that information, which often doesn't go well. So there's two, there's two different ones, um, but I usually start with this because that's more complex and no one's gonna sit down and do the leader one where you're writing out a email one unless they're willing to do the first one. If they don't do it with their own team, yeah. the second version of this one ever happen, is that that's a way more complex so i don't really yeah, make sense you know there. the more people you interact with the more specific your blueprint probably yeah it has to be. be because you can't you can't sit down and you don't have the ability and you want to people potentially two levels below you to be able to send you information and understand if you do this this is how i'll take it right mm-hmm, absolutely so that's different but the rest of your team you don't have to get as specific on it, but it, you, cause you can have more real time conversations about it. But mm-hmm. if you're in the ballpark of it, these things will just happen, right? You'll start to figure this out and you won't need to get to that level of details with it. Right. Exactly. Well, and it's just so, it's so nice to, to have something that says, this is how you interact with this person, or this is their, this is their personality type, or this is who they are. This is how, you know, they answer questions better, what, whatever it is. Um, it just helps with efficiencies, which I'm a CPA. I love efficiencies. That's what we do around here. So, you know, and just helping our clients also create these for their people, for their clients, for their yeah. team. And I think it, and the other thing it helps too, is there's all these personality tests that no one uses. And I think the problem with that is, is that they say that on this way or that, like mm-hmm. if it's communication things, that's not specific enough. It's not. It, 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 I, I'm finding more and more that those are, those can be useful at a high level. Yes. But they're not helpful in the details. And the devil is in the details when it comes to these things. I want a user manual to know, like I'm setting up something complex at home, mm-hmm. exactly what to do and how to troubleshoot it and everything else. So I feel confident going in and having a conversation with you. I don't really feel like when people take this, cause I've learned how to do it, that they're walking into other people's office when they have detailed things and feel that comfortable with it. 
and can pull out a manual or do whatever. Like it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't work at that granular level. And that's no, where the requirement is today in today's workforce in order, especially again, it's the agile teams, right? If we're back 30, 40 years ago where people worked a lot longer together, mm -hmm. there's more leeway and people viewed these relationships and things differently. So there was, a, you know, still it would be valuable to have this, but it's different. Now, you don't really, it, it's a requirement and it's mandatory. It's not an option. And if you don't have it, it's a competitive disadvantage in a significant way. And you are essentially saying, you will have a retention problem because someone will leave because if you think that 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, or 100 people are randomly going to fig all figure out how to work together. <laughs> like I have some swamp land in Florida, so you too. <laughs> There's lots of swamp land in Florida. I know. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to skip forward a little bit. So actually, I want to ask this question. So what tips do you have to help people be more vulnerable? Well, one, it's never easy. No. And two, no one wants to lead with it. So don't think that someone does because it's the hardest thing to do. And even when you feel like you're good at it, mm -hmm. it's always hard. But here's the thing, unless you do it, mm -hmm. you don't, when you do it, you tell the other person it's safe to share with me. Right. Okay. So that's, it's so funny. I was telling someone the other day, like people will like, I'll meet people for the first time and they'll literally tell me stuff they don't talk to other people about. So I always like wonder like, why am I vulnerable? I must have been vulnerable about something. Yeah. For you probably to tell were me, and don't realize it. Yeah. Right? For somebody to tell me like their whole reproductive history, like story, like it just happens. Uh, Nonverbal communication. I mean, there, there, you, you, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of things that can be a part of that. Right. Mm -hmm. But everyone has to have that. Yeah. Some, and for some reason, I feel like a safe place for people sometimes. Yeah. I just find that. People can, yeah. No, but that's the truth because ultimately psychological safety is a requirement mm -hmm. for someone to share their deepest things and to trust you that yeah. you will keep it secret, not share it, respect the boundaries. I mean, all these other things are pieces of it, right? So that's, that's a huge piece of it, but you have to do that. And if you don't, you can't get to know people, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is if you're not vulnerable, don't know people, mm -hmm. you will have more miscommunications, misunderstandings, and other things that'll cause you a lot of emotional turmoil. And you're not allowing other people to be themselves around you either because they feel like they can't, right? You right. have to lead with it to allow them to say, you can be you, you can be imperfectly perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't expect that of you, right? I expect other things of you, accountability and giving forth your best efforts, whatever those might be, right? But, mm -hmm. that, but being perfect and keeping silent and you know, all the rest of that is not part of it. So you have to be able to do that. And part of that is by, and the easiest way to do that is by start by asking questions. Mm -hmm. Because... Everyone likes to talk about themselves, right? I mean, so, but the key is, is you've got to start asking vulnerable questions so you can actually get somewhere, not ask surface level questions, because mm -hmm. then it really just, then you don't get anywhere. And it's funny because playing my game and doing it in groups, um, one of the things I've learned over the last couple of years is when I started, when I gave questions to groups to do it after I'm speaking, mm -hmm. uh, I'll give them a question set. And I usually started to do, uh, I, I call them conversation starters, right? And mm -hmm. I always thought in my head, oh, I've got to start these rather than the connection questions, which are deeper ones, right? Okay. And so I always led with one and then went to the rest of them. And then I said, really, do I need to do any of that? What if I just dove right into the deep end of the ocean and started off? And then I started doing that and it worked just as well. In fact, it worked better. Mm -hmm. And I realized that people just don't want all the small talk. And when you talk to people who are like introverts, their biggest issue with talking to people okay. is... I don't, I, it takes a lot of energy for do all the con, have conversations to create it, to start it, to mm -hmm. do it. If I could get rid of all the small talk and get down to things that matter, I'd be willing to do a lot more conversations that I'm currently doing, whatever that is, mm -hmm. but I'm not because the requirement is for me to have this idle chit chat with people that I don't really care about. So then I just don't want, I want to opt out. Yes, right? That's so, so true. Right? As and an then, introvert, 
card carrying introvert right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I've asked a lot of people because I'm trying to understand like where it is and now I realize that you don't need to go to that place, right? You mm -hmm. can start to ask people questions. Like, so what are you most excited about in your life right now? Ooh. Well, that's telling you what they care about the most, mm -hmm. what they're motivated about. You don't have to ask them how their day is or where they work at or other things like that. Sure, you can if you feel like you need to ask that, but you don't need to. Uh, you know, when I'm asking, and I'll ask in groups, like one of the first things now that I lead off with when I'm doing, you know, when I'm at conferences and I'm speaking or even these groups and workshops, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll ask the first question now is what's the most important lesson you've learned in the last year? Ooh, that's a good one. Which is a very vulnerable question when you come to think of it, but people will share it, right? Because people, because people have to reveal a failure. Yeah, or they'll reveal something that they feel is super important to them that they learn and gleaned, which tells you a lot about them as an individual, right? So good. So and, good. And then I'll ask usually the second question when I'm at, when I'm, and these are just because now I've structured these things. So the other thing, the next thing I do is I try to set up a question where I'm trying to ask them something where they feel grateful or really positive or will get to some memory that will be really good mm -hmm. because they've shown in studies that when you do that, um, it emits, you know, all these positive chemicals mm -hmm. and they get pretty excited about it. So, you know, I'll ask people a question like, who's your personal hero or another version is, is, you know, if you could say thank you to one person that helped you in your life, you know, who is that person and what do they do? Right. I love that. Either one allows you an opportunity to share a pretty deep experience it, and anchor it in a person. That's right? so cool. Cause if you ask a question, like I'll ask people a question in the past, like what are you most grateful for? Mm -hmm. I, that, because I don't necessarily anchor it in an individual, I don't know where it's going to go. But usually when you talk about a person, that'll evoke some level of emotion in a deep one and get people going, right? And then you just go on and ask other questions from there in the group. And what happens is, and then everyone answers the same question, right, in the group. So, and then if you're doing it in a group, the most senior person goes because they've got, they like senior meaning if you're in a company and you work with them, whoever's the highest level person, mm -hmm. because then they're, sh they're saying it's safe to share with them, right? Unconsciously. Well, right. right because if the, the highest manager goes first, then they're creating trust already. And yeah. then everybody feels happy. And then I love that you're creating, there's questions that create good like good happy oxytocin -y feelings and then you could and then you could follow that question up with, then you get to the meaty ones right yeah, then you get to the is, ones like what's your biggest setback in the last yeah, five years yeah what's i just wrote down guys I just, like i just wrote down what is your biggest what is your greatest obstacle in business right now yeah exactly right and why what why is it that for you right and then when you get into it then you can be like oh wow this is like then you can because then what happens is you create vulnerability, you get the permission to ask significantly deeper things because also mm -hmm. you're answering as well, right? You're part right. of this. Right. And then they'll want to go to that level and be willing to put everything on the table. And then you're and, getting their actual pain points. They're getting, you're getting yeah, the things. they're learning everything. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, I always reframe this as like, how do I get to know my clients better and quicker? And how do I get to the core of like what their problems are and how we can help fix them? Because a lot of yeah. times people are just like, I need my accounting done. Okay, but why? You know, so that really just like helps me. Yeah, what, like, what happens? Kind of and... re yeah, like reframe how we, you know, we ask ask our upfront questions a little bit so that we can maybe yeah. get to better vulnerabilities or obstacles in businesses so that we can really help people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the key thing. And then that way you can get, and this is where the magic starts to all kind of happen for people. And then the thing about it is when everyone shares in the group, mm -hmm. Everyone looks around and says, wow, you're just like me. You're just like me. Right. And the thing about starts to happen is that uh, the other thing that's really interesting is there's a couple of phenomena that are interesting. One is that I don't have to relate to every person in the group. If I can relate to a couple people, like let's say there are six people and I can relate to two or three really well, I'll mm -hmm. attribute it to all six. Right. So I change. And if I'm in a room full of a hundred people, mm -hmm. what happens is I attribute to everyone in the room. Because I assume everyone's having the same conversations as me and you'll start to interact with them the same as the people in the group because I've seen this happen before, right? Because I started so doing it and I didn't really know this when I did some larger groups because I thought about, well, maybe I should have rotated groups. And then I realized that it pretty much happened the same way. And I mm -hmm. thought about, 
you know, at some point I may rotate groups. So there's a reason why you would, but there are different reasons why. Like I would do it if there were challenges and multi-levels in the organization, like mm -hmm. the teams were having specific challenges and, mm -hmm. and, and there may be, um, they weren't working across the organization as well. And they were willing to take the time, right? Because right. it's going to take a certain matter of time to do this. And a lot of times I, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. Like they're not willing to take the time um, because you have to ask a certain amount of questions to get to know someone um, in terms of a lot deeper, right? If, you, right? if you're in a client situation and you can't ask as many, asking a couple of these mm -hmm. build trust and rapport in a significant way to help you. They won't give you the in-depth information, right. but it will help you enough, right? Mm -hmm. So there are different reasons why you would do some of these things and different outcomes. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to get the full benefit of doing these things, right, mm -hmm. then you do more, I usually say do like eight to 12. And what's interesting is every speaking event I, I'm at, I'll ask people at the end. So, you know, we'll go through, I'll hand them like seven questions. Now I put it on a sheet mm -hmm. and we may not go through all of them. And I'll say, so do the people that are closest in your life, could anyone, anyone could raise their hand if they would know answers to all seven questions mm -hmm. and no one ever raises their hand. And then I ask the people you work with, is there any person who could answer all seven questions right now about you? And no one raises their hand. And I said, well, that's the problem, right? The bar is really low and no one knows who you are and you're hiding. Right. And, that, and if you didn't imagine it will be possible. Right. I love that. I love this so much. I've just wrote down a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I have so many, so many notes for myself, right? Yeah. And it will help any person. I mean, this, and this is applicable both in, internal and external it really doesn't matter. And, and, you know, when people sales people ask me these questions, I'm like, well, Doing this gets you in the mind of the top 1% salespeople because right. this is how they build relationships with clients, like in, they're snapping their fingers. Mm -hmm. They can't explain it to you because it's innate in what they do. Right. And, and it's their unique twist on it. And this is a tool. It is not something you have to copy exactly, but it does, it gets you into the frame of mind what people are doing so you can take the information and then utilize it however it is that's best for you and construct it in that way. Mm -hmm. But you have to get to that point where you can say, oh, this is what it does. This mm -hmm. is how people react. This is what people say. So I know the feeling. I know what it looks like. So mm -hmm. at least then you can get closer and know it because that will help you. Otherwise, you just keep thinking it's this amorphous thing and you can never get there because you can't experience it and know that you're in the experience in that moment. This is so good. So good, Jason. I just keep going back to, you know, CPAs are the most trusted, you know, trusted profession. And I'm always just like, why? <laughs> You know, what are they doing? What do they know? How are they, you know, how are, how are those relationships built where we, where we are that yeah. most, trust, most trusted profession. And I, it, it boggles my mind how many people come to me because they're CPA or they're a tax person or whoever, they just don't communicate with them. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's, it's, it, it really, I mean, it, it, the, the challenge like, you know, in your industry is one is that there are tons of, there's tons of great people. Mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of people who can operate on a high level. Mm -hmm. It's now your ability to interact with people who are in a challenging situation or in stress, don't know mm -hmm. what to do, mm -hmm. and they need you to hold their hand, right? It's the mm -hmm. same thing in the medical industry. You see the same yeah. thing, right? You'll see hospitals where the difference really lies in the relationships between the doctors and the nurses, mm -hmm. right? Right. Because then everything runs a lot better, but that teamwork. often doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. So then that's the issue. Right. And the same thing in your business. A lot of it's that there's a lot of capable people out there. Right. I mean, in some more than others, mm -hmm. but if you can't relate to other people, your business is going to hurt because you're going to, you're going to lose people and not have people in your business because you're over the long term because they're not going to feel comfortable engaging with you. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge piece of this whole thing. Right. Of having long-term clients that won't leave. And where price doesn't matter. In the beginning, probably price matters for everyone, but over the long term, it really doesn't, right? Like, I, I give you an like, example. I go into someone who cuts my hair, and someone introduced me to her, like, when I first got to Dallas, and I pay way too much money for my haircut, right? But I really like the person. They do a great job. Well, I, I would never leave the person. Right? <laughs> ever, right? No. 
<laughs> even though it's ridiculous when I look at some of my other friends and what they're paying versus what I'm paying and I'm going to a salon to do it and, but I wouldn't do it. And I think feel most people would do the same thing. I mean, you know, within reason, right. Oh, but right. It, you can have a pretty significant margin difference than someone else mm-hmm. where they're going to do it over the long term and not do it if they trust you and mm-hmm. do it, especially whatever it is. And you can easily raise the rates on people and they won't even blink an eye if they trust you in doing it. Right. Mm-hmm. No one And they will. see the value in they the see relationship. The Right? Whatever it is, right? Awesome. All right. Well, before I ask you my last question, I actually have a ton more questions for you, so I'm going to need you to come back. Okay. <laughs> um, what is the easiest way for people to find you? So they can go to my website. It's uh, jasontreu.com. That's mm-hmm. jasontreu.com. Awesome. And we'll link all that stuff in the description boxes so people can get to awesome. them easily. Um, okay. So last question for you, um, for anyone wanting to build social wealth, um, more relationships, uh, what would be your number one tip to get them started today? I would say that the easiest place to go to places, I, I try to find places to go mm-hmm. because I find that that is the hardest part. And I would always go to a place where people are giving, helping, and inspiring people. Okay. And that first place would be a charity group, right? Meaning, oh. you know, American Cancer Society, whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. You know, big brothers, big sisters, anything that you had some affinity for, right? You know, adopt pets, SPCA, whatever it is, right? It doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. The second thing place I would go would be if you're into the arts and that's kind of what you lead with. Mm-hmm. And there are museums, opera, symphony, ballet, whatever. And those have a lot of people because then at least you're finding something that you like and are passionate about and people that are doing it as well. And then just start going and asking people questions and leading with it. Right. Okay. And that's what you got to do. And if you really like, and if you're nervous, the other thing you can do is offer to work like a check-in table, call them up and they always need help mm-hmm. and offer to help and do something because then You'll meet people in the organization, right? And you could probably get in for free the first time and okay. test it out. And really all cool. these things, organizations are like, you know, relationships. It's like dating. You, you, you try it out and you see if it fits for you and you like the people. Mm-hmm. And everything's going to be different for every person. So um, you may have to try a few to find the one that you really enjoy. But then... Mm-hmm you can start to see the opportunities here because these are where social mobile people are that mm-hmm. care, right? Mm-hmm. They're that good are people. Invested, that are good people that are doing mm-hmm. a lot of things, which are the people you want to be around. I love that. You're doing something that's important to you and, mm-hmm. and you're helping people at the same time, which is, I think, you know, incredibly important to do in our world by giving back and, you know, why not, you know, kill multiple birds with one stone. I love it. That's a great trip. So find, find an organization that you, you're, you feel passionate about and go volunteer and meet people. Simple. Create relationships with those people and see if it's a good fit for you. Yeah. That is really simple. That's more simple than, you know, there's more than that, but that's a, that's a great start. And that's be simple. Anyone can do that. And just, you know, look it up, Google, find it (laughs) there. Think about what you care about. Yeah. Some place to help. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening. If you found this podcast to be inspiring, helpful, and entertaining, please like and subscribe. This helps us grow the community and reach more people. If you are interested in learning more about this episode's guests or accessing any of the books or other resources mentioned in this episode, be sure to check out the description box below. Until next time, be abundant.